This is a track saw or plunge saw as they call them. This is the kind of track thing that you can use them with. And today I'm gonna to give you six and a half random tips that might help you if you use one of these things. Oh man, you need to clean me clapperboard. Hiya, welcome back to the Gosforth Handyman Tip Library. Hope you're having a wonderful day so far. Today I'm going to give you six and a half random tips all about track saws or plunge saws as they sometimes get called. Now most of these tips are from the perspective of a Festool TS55 track saw but I think they'll apply no matter what kind of saw you've got pretty much. I have no axe to grind either way over who makes the best track saw and I really don't care. It's a saw, it cuts stuff. So tip number one and this will be probably the most obvious tip of them all to people who are used to using a track saw but if you've never used one before this isn't so obvious and it's something that you've really got to get used to. Generally you're always going to have the track or the guide rail sitting on top of the piece of wood that you want to keep. That's not a hard and fast 100% rule, but if you get into that kind of habit, things generally work a bit better. So to the left of the track, you've got your good wood. To the right of the track, you've got your waste wood. And that's simply because the blade is running up the right hand side of the track, the side where you've got the splinter guard. The splinter guard is this little piece of plastic that runs up the side of the track. It's the bit that you cut the first time you use the track. If that's on the right and your blade is on the right, then that's the side where the thickness of the blade is gonna remove excess material. So if you've measured from this side up to a line, then that's gonna be fine. If you've measured from the right hand side up to a line, then you're gonna remove the line plus the thickness of the blade, which is generally no good. So if you are wanting to measure from the right, you're gonna to have to knock this back to the left to account for the thickness of the blade. And it kind of defeats the object of having a track saw then because then you can't line up your splinter guard to where you're cutting. The habit I like to get into is to always have the splinter guard on the opposite side to where I've measured from. So if I've measured from the left, the splinter guard's on the right. If I've measured from the right hand side of the piece, my splinter guard needs to be on the left and I need to cut from the other direction, come round the other side of the piece of wood. In other words, my splinter guard is still gonna be on the right. It has to be, because the saw is coming up that direction. The saw can only go that way so that the blade of the saw is running past the splinter guard. There's an exception to the rule here because I think DeWalt make a track where it has a splinter guard on both sides, which is a really nice feature because it saves having to turn the track around if you want to make a cut from the other direction. But the same rule still applies. Even if you're cutting from that direction, the saw blade is still on the right from your perspective. It has to be because that's where the saw blade is. And unless they radically change the design of track saws over the next few years, that's where the saw blade will always be. So dead simple, as I say, measure from the left, splinter guard on the right, can't go wrong. Tip number two, the grips on the underside of the guide rail are amazing you will be amazed what you can get away with cutting without having any clamps at all. They stick to materials so well. The problem is, as they start to get full of dust and other bits of goob, they stop sticking. So I find the best way to clean them is to just give them a blast of air from the air gun. And every now and then what I also do is I get out some masking tape, stick the masking tape onto the foam strip or neoprene or whatever it is, onto the strip, stick the masking tape on, take the masking tape back off, and honestly, they'll be as good as new. If you try and get into the habit of using an air gun, if you've got a compressor to hand, which probably if you do in joinery, you generally have, but if you haven't, you can use obviously air in a can or whatever. But if you try and get into the habit of just giving whatever you're cutting a quick blast of air to get the dust off it, give your tracks a quick blast of air, honestly, they'll be ultra grippy, they'll be like good as new, and you'll have no problems with the guide rails slipping. If they do get really mangled up and full of dust and you can't get it out and clean, you can buy replacement strips for your guide rails and that is relatively easy to do. But I've never had to do that. Mine 
I use almost every day and I've had no problems with wear or tear and they work as if they were brand new basically. I, I clean them down every day when I'm finished with the air gun. I try to clean the piece before cutting it and it helps them to stick better and it stops them getting clogged up with dust. Tip number three. If you don't have a parallel guide system or some other fancy piece of paraphernalia to help you do right angle cuts, just having a large framing square to hand will help you get nice accurate right angle cross cuts, no problem at all. Tip number four. Again, this might sound obvious if you're used to using track saws, but if you're new to them, it might be a useful tip for you. Try and keep your power cable and dust hose going in the same direction. Unless you've got a battery operated track saw, you are going to have a power cable and a dust hose. And trust me, you're gonna to want to make use of the dust extraction. If you plug in your power cable in front of the saw, on this side and you plug in your dust extraction to the back of the saw over that side, I guarantee at some point you will trip over either the power cable or the dust hose and risk damage to yourself and more importantly, your shiny saw. It's much safer to have your power and dust coming from one direction. I like to have my power and dust in front of where I'm cutting. That way, the further I get through a cut, the less I have to worry about running out of cable or dust hose, but it's completely a matter of preference. Another really good way of doing it is to have your power and dust coming from above, if that's practical. Plan your cuts and work out where are your power cable and dust hose gonna end up at the beginning of your cut and at the end of your cut. That is really critical for safety and for practicality, because if it gets snagged, not only can it be dangerous and cause things like kickback, but it can also ruin your workpiece because it can cause the track to run out of skew. Festool do sell a combined anti-static smooth dust hose with a cable kind of built into it, but it's even more expensive than the bog standard Festool dust hose, which is the most expensive dust hose I have ever bought. And you can also get some quite handy little cable clips that clip your dust hose and cable together. Axminster Tools do them. They're about nine pound for a pack of three though, which once you've bought all the clips that you'd need to do, say a five meter hose, you'd probably be cheaper just buying a new hose with the integrated cable and dust management all in one. A much cheaper way of doing it, of course, is just to zip tie your cable to your dust extraction hose if that's practical for the way you work. Of course, you can also use the cord deflector, but I, never use this. I just haven't got time to swap and change it between tracks. Between cuts, I'm often switching from one track to another. I'm often joining tracks together. I don't have time to mess around with that, to be honest, but it's a nice idea. If you use the same track all the time, maybe that's something that might help. Oh, tip number five. If ideally, you need a flat surface to cut on that supports both sides of the workpiece. I like to use Celotex foam. I find it works really well. It's nice and light. It's dead cheap. You can use both sides of it. It's flat. You use whatever you want. Pop in the comments what you prefer to use if you've got any better ideas of what to use as a stable base for cutting on. But you do ideally need something that's going to support your workpiece on both sides. If you don't have that, what can happen is when you get through the cut, the workpiece can drop in the middle and that can cause snagging of the blade and worst case kickback. Tip number six. When I'm working with the track saw in the workshop, I'm forever needing to get the guide rails out the road when I'm not using them. So what I've got is little hooks high up all around my workshop in convenient places so that when I'm not using the tracks, I can just quickly shove it on a hook get on with whatever I need to do, but I've still got it to hand to take down and use again whenever I need it. Most tracks have a hole on both sides for hanging them up. It just makes life so much easier to just shove them on a screw sticking out the wall, get them out the road, because you don't want to accidentally stand on these or drop them. They are expensive, the tracks. Look after them and they will last you a lifetime. Tip number six and a half. This isn't so much a tip, but just a general kind of fact. I was always a little bit confused by the slightly dodgy friction fit dust port hose on the standard D27 hose. You've got these nice kind of bayonet type fittings on the outside 
and inside of the hose connector on the saw, but the dust hose doesn't have any such thing to let you actually connect that up. So it's just kind of a, a dodgy friction fit. And obviously once it's in, you can then disconnect it there. But ultimately that can of its own accord just fall out. And I always thought that's a bit of a weird design for such an expensive saw. I have since found out that later versions of this hose, oops, later versions of this hose have a bayonet type connector on. So if you have the type of hose that is just flat like that, you are gonna have that problem as far as I'm aware. Again, I'd love to hear in the comments of why it's like that on the Festool. I don't know what it's like on other saws, but it just seems a bit of a dodgy way of connecting it up. But the newer hoses do have a proper kind of locking connector on the end of the hose. So if you're buying a TS55, make sure you get the new style of hose that has the locking bayonet connector on the end. And then there's no risk of that accidentally falling out. I did try to research it a bit on the Festool website, so I don't know if this is just something that's gradually getting phased into the product range or not. It seems to have some hoses with the bayonet connector on the end and some without the bayonet connector or the locking connector. If you know more about that, I'd love to hear about it in the comments below. The best comment will get pinned. That's it for today though. You've had your six and a half tips. What more do you want? For now, thank you for watching. If you haven't already subscribed, please hit that subscribe button and hit the notification bell as well so that you hear about new videos when they're coming out. Otherwise, YouTube won't bother to tell you. If you're new to the channel, my tip videos come out on a Saturday morning UK time roughly every one to two weeks. So hit subscribe and you'll obviously see these when they come out. In the meantime, you can also follow me on Instagram at Gosforth Handyman and you can kind of see what I'm up to, what I'm building for customers and you can kind of get a bit more of a real time view of what's going on. But thank you again for watching you lovely, lovely people. I shall see you next time. Bye.